Hey everyone, so as you may or may not be able to tell, I've moved house again. This is actually my fifth address since November last year, which should give you some clue as to why videos have not been, um, frequent. My life has been somewhat chaotic, but I'm hoping that things are going to settle down, become more stable, and I'll be able to do this more regularly. I'm not going to make any promises in case I can't keep them, but that is my hope. I also want to start using my Irish more in videos, um, but don't worry, for those of you without Irish, the bulk of my storytelling is still going to be in English because I am definitely not fluent enough to start telling stories in Irish. I just might drop some words here and there to help me gain confidence in using my Irish out loud. Anyway, to scale new agam ditch anew, well, Sean scale, ach, scale Ella, I have a new story for you today. Well, an old story, but another story. So there are a lot of medieval Irish stories where the title starts with the word Tyne Bow. The most famous of these would be Tyne Bacullinger, which is so famous that if you just say the Tyne, people will assume that's the one you're talking about. And this is, of course, the famous story of the 17-year-old Cuchulain single-handedly defending his province when Medhav of Connacht decides to invade it. Today we are not talking about Tyne Bacullinger, we are talking about a different Tyne. Two of our other Tynes, well, Tana is the correct plural, are Tyne Beregavine and Tyne Beregavna. They are both Ulster cycle texts and they have such incredibly similar names that a few weeks ago the group chat was talking about how we couldn't remember which was which, at which point one person chimed in with, wait those are two different texts? Yes, they are two separate texts. One of them is the story of Cullen and the Morrigan having an argument about a cow, and the other one is about the Seven Manias. It has taken me a long time to be able to say with any confidence which title goes with which story, despite literally having published an article that repeatedly cites one of them because it's a study of the Seven Manias. For your information, that is in Cambrian Medieval Celtic Studies 83, which looks like it's on the other side of the room. One second. It looks like this. You can buy it. It's five pounds. It has my first academic publication in it. So I really should know the difference. But now, by request, to aid the group chat and myself in telling them apart, I will now retell Tyne Baragovna. And then next time, I will retell Tyne Baragovine. And after that, we will all know which one is which. Until the next time I lose track and give them the wrong name. So, one small challenge about Time Beregovna is that it hasn't been translated into English very recently, and by not very recently I mean a guy called Lee translated it in 1905, and nobody has done it since. Well, helpfully that is out of copyright and available on Gutenberg, um, but it's probably overdue for a retranslation. There has been a fair amount of study on it in German, but not in English, which is actually surprisingly common in our field. So I will be working from Lee's translation because if I stop to translate the whole thing myself, this video will never get made. But just bear in mind that it could probably use another look sometime. Anyway, this text comes from two manuscripts, um, the Yellow Book of Lecan, which is my mom's favourite medieval manuscript for reasons that will take far too long to explain, and Edgerton 1782. Yellow Book of Lecan is probably 14th or 15th century, Edgerton 1782 is 16th century, but the text is early Irish, so it's probably quite a bit older than that and would have come from somewhere else before it ended up in those manuscripts. It's a scale, so that's a foretale or a prequel to Time the Coolinger, and it kind of helps clarify one episode in it, but it's not so essential that you won't know what's going on in Time the Coolinger if you haven't read this one first. It's also closely related to another story, as we will see. So, the title, Time Beregovna. I mean, a time bow is a cattle raid, so that part's easy, but what does Regovna mean? Yeah, great question. Um, so we don't know. It doesn't really relate to the content of the story. It's unclear why it's called that. Since it's incredibly confusing with Time for Regavon, I am firmly in favour of somebody renaming this story and then we wouldn't have this confusion in the first place. But that might only make things more complicated. Ernst Windisch, who edited it, argued for calling it Time for Marigna because the Morrigan is in it. You guys know me well enough by now to know that I normally stay away from the more mythological material for the sake of my own sanity because it is a thorny topic to talk about online when these stories and characters mean so many different things to different people. But I make exceptions whenever those more godlike characters start interacting with Cahullan, who is after all my boy, um, and he is a weird and supernatural lad so this happens not to infrequently. Thus, I will take a deep breath, try not to panic, and do my best. Esht. Fado fado vi in a Long, long ago, Cuchulain was asleep 
at Dun Imri when he heard a horrible cry from the north. The terror of it woke him up so suddenly that he fell out of bed, hitting the ground hard. He grabbed his weapons and ran out of the house with his wife following him with his clothes because she is, as ever, the only person in any of these stories with any common sense. When he gets outside, he sees his charioteer Lig coming towards him from the north in his chariot. What are you doing here? says Cahillan. And side note, this is fascinating to me because it implies that Lyg does not live with Cuchulain as is suggested elsewhere, but he has his own home, which in this text is named as Ferta Lyg. Now a Fert can be a mound or a tumulus, and that's frequently a burial mound, so this has distinctly ominous vibes and suggests we should probably read Lyg as having some kind of otherworldly connection, which wouldn't be out of keeping with how he's portrayed elsewhere. On the other hand, a Fert is also a name for a part of the chariot, probably some kind of shaft or pole, no one's totally sure on that, which would be plausible for Lyg as a charioteer, but doesn't make much sense as a place name. So it's probably Fert in the mound sense, which can also be like a boundary dyke. So I would say this is just Lyg being weird and liminal and living on boundaries and in mounds again. In general, the fact that he has his own home and doesn't live with Kukulun ever as he does elsewhere is just a little bit of a fun fact about this story and I am getting very distracted and we are in the first paragraph. Sorry about that. Loic is my son and I'm very attached to him. So back to Cuchulain. He's like, what are you doing here? And Loic says, oh, well, I heard a cry coming from the northwest across the great road of Calhoun. And since Cuchulain also heard this noise and it was so loud it woke him up, he is intrigued and he proposes that they go in search of whatever made this noise. So they go and when they reach after Ferta, they hear the sound of a chariot and pretty soon the chariot comes into view. It is pulled by one red horse, that's probably chestnut for those who care about horse colours, which has one foot and the pole of the chariot goes through the body of the horse and is fixed to its forehead. Now I have no idea what this is supposed to mean other than indicating to us that this is not a normal horse. However, when I was working on this story last year, the group chat shared some theories and our ultimate conclusion was that this is a medieval author's attempt at describing a Reliant Robin or some other three-wheeled car. Uh, behold, the chariot. Alternatively, it is a hobby horse. I don't understand what else is happening here, like this horse is going to be bouncing like a pogo stick that seems wildly impractical for pulling a chariot. And there is a woman in the chariot dressed all in red. She's red-headed, has red eyebrows and her cloak so long it drags on the floor behind the chariot. Beside her is a man in a red cloak and he's holding a forked hazel staff and driving a cow in front of him. You know, I don't think that cow wants to be taken by you, says Kukhalam. Well, it's not your cow says the woman, nor the cow of any of your friends. I am responsible for all the cows in Ulster, says Cuchulain. Now this is probably a reference to the story of how Cuchulain got his name, because when he takes the place of the Hound of Cullum, he swears to protect the cattle and people of Magmahevna especially, but also Ulster more broadly, which is how he ends up as the position of the sole defender of the Ulv in time to Cougar. That's literally his job, that is why he is called Cuchulain. That's probably what he is referring to in terms of his cow responsibilities. And the woman is like, oh, so you're gonna take this cow from me? Cause like, I don't think you're strong enough for that. And Cuchulain, who unfortunately does not drink his respect women juice, is like, why is the woman speaking to me when there is a man right here? And she's like, cause you asked me, so I answered. And he goes, nah, why would I ask a woman? I asked him, you just happened to answer. What is his name? And this, <laughs> this is the part I dread. Hurricaith Shkir Lucha Shkir is his name, she says, which translates to cold wind and much rushes according to uh, Leahy, which is a fairly badass name, but that doesn't make me any happier about having to try and say it out loud with my horrible semi-medieval hybrid Irish. That is a weird name, says Cuchulain. But what about you? What's your name? And this time it's the man who answers and says her name is Feborbegbjol Kuftir Foltschken Garret Uf. Sorry. Now I am seriously regretting telling this particular story. I forgot about these names. And that name means Little mouthed, edged, equally small, hair short, splinter, much clamour, according to Leahy, who may or may not be right, because I have no idea what that's supposed to mean. And Kukhalan is like, are you guys screwing with me? This is ridiculous. So he jumps into the chariot, onto the woman's shoulders, and like presses his spear down against the top of her head, presumably planning to make a kebab of her if she doesn't start giving him a straight answer. Please don't stab me, she says. Tell me your real name, says Kukhalan still threatening her. Get off me, she says. I'm actually a female satirist and this man is Dyer Mach from Kulinger. I told a really great poem and this cow is my payment. So you can see I didn't steal it. Okay then, I don't believe you, but if you can tell me this wonderful poem, I can judge how plausible it is that you could have won a cow for it. 
Well, get off me first, says the woman. It's not going to help you at all if you keep threatening me. So he jumps off and stands between the two poles of the chariot and she sings him the poem. Now, Lee doesn't include the poem in his translation, which is wildly unhelpful of him, but he explains in the introduction that it is difficult and corrupt and he can make nothing of it except that it is a jeering account of the War of Kulinger, i.e. it's a prophecy about the Tyne and it is not a particularly flattering one. Now I do always like it when experienced scholars admit that they don't have a clue what's going on because it makes me feel better about my own translation, but also I wish he had at least tried. <laughs> However, Windish doesn't even give the poems in Irish in his edition because they are corrupt enough that he can't figure out how to spell them, so even if I were so inclined I could not translate the poem for you myself to tell you. Very tragic. So, little challenge for you. Write me a sneering and mean little prophecy about the time in the comments which we can pretend is the missing poem. In any case, whatever she says, it pisses Kukulan off and he throws something at her and suddenly they're gone. The horse, the woman, the chariot, the man, the cow, all of them vanished. Then he sees a black bird sitting on a branch near him. You're a dangerous woman, says Cuchillan to the bird, because he is a lot better at recognising his enemies in bird form than in human form. Either that or he just assumes all birds are the Morrigan and we only have stories about the times he was right. Also, interestingly, this suggests that she was all of the figures in the tableau, the, the horse, the woman, the chariot, the man, the cow, because otherwise they would not all have vanished when she transformed. Either that or it's some kind of illusion situation and they are still present but concealed. I don't know, there's a lot about the mechanics of shapeshifting here that you could go into in great depth, which I did in an essay last year, but I wouldn't recommend it, it was a very bad essay. In any case, she's a bird now and Cuchelan is not happy about it. Henceforth, this clay land will be called Dolueth, which means of evil, and it has been called Grelach Dolueth ever since. Nice little bit of Din Henahas or place name lore for you there. Now, if I had known it was you, says Cuchelan, this would have gone down differently. Well, it's gonna cause you all sorts of trouble now, she says. You should definitely not have threatened me. You don't have power over me, he says. I absolutely do, she says. It is at the guarding of thy death that I am and I shall be, which is what it says on my t-shirt, which is why I'm wearing a vest top in September even though it is really not warm enough. This fabulous design is by Forfeda Designs. They are great. They are both gorgeous and well researched. I will put a link in the description to their Tumblr and Redbubble shops. Sorry for the digression. Uh, so I've never been totally sure if this I am at the guarding of thy death is a promise or a threat, like is she saying she's gonna cause his death or just that she knows when it's gonna happen and isn't gonna kill him until that time? I don't know. But she says, I brought this cow out of the fairy mound of Kruachon so that she can breed with the Don Kulinger. And here we have an interesting intertextual link. So remember how a couple of years ago at Halloween I told the story of Echtranera and I said that it was a fragmentary version of Time Beregovna but that I didn't know anything about Time Beregovna so I couldn't tell you more than that. Well, here it is. I've learned things in the last two years and this is the story that I didn't know then. So that cow, that one we store in Echtranera, that is the one showing up here. I love it when stories do that because even though sorting them into cycles, the Ulster cycle, the Finn cycle, etc. is a very modern invention, this proves to us that a lot of them were were interconnected in the minds of medieval authors, particularly the Revschela of the Tyne, which are connected by what they're building up towards, uh, but some of them are more interconnected than others, and this one is quite clearly connected to Echtranera and to the Tyne. So she says, the cow that's going to result from that breeding, you're fine until it's one year old, but after that we're going to have the Tyne Bakulinger, and that's going to be your downfall. Cuchelan is not worried about this. Um, he says, the tide is only going to make me more glorious. I'm going to kill all of their warriors, all of their hosts. I'm going to survive the whole thing. Which, I mean, he is technically right. But the Morrigan is like, oh, you think? Because when you finally meet your match in combat, when you meet with someone equally strong and fierce and noble and brave, etc., etc., I am going to come to you in the form of an eel and tangle myself around your feet so that you fall. And Cuchelan says, well, I'll smash you against the rocks of the ford and I won't heal you either. Then I'll be a grey wolf against you, she says, and I'll rip the flesh from your bones. I'll beat you up, he says, until one of your eyes pops out and I won't heal you either. Then I'll come as a white heifer with red ears and I'll stampede with a hundred cows and your strength will be severely tested because we will rip your head off. I'll break your legs with my slingshot, says Cuchulain, and I won't heal you either. And that was the end of that conversation. And Cuchulain went back to Dun Imri, and the Morrigan went with her cow to the fairy mound of Kruachan, and thus it was, until the time of Kulinger, when this whole shape-shifting disagreement does occur, 
and nobody has a good time. Or if you look in the other manuscript, it says that it was the Bathov, not the Morrigan. But the Bathov and the Morrigan are very closely connected figures, you've probably heard the term triple goddess bandied around. Some would consider them to be different aspects of the same entity. In any case, the name Bathov literally means crow, and we can see in the story that she turns into a black bird, so that might be why that scribe decides to use that name instead. I don't think there's too much value in getting bogged down trying to figure out her, the question of her exact identity and the relationship between these figures, but when she shows up in the Tyne in the combat with Loch and transforms into an eel, a wolf and a heifer, she is identified in the mar narrative as the Morrigan, and that is probably the best name to be using for her here. And if you want to read that part of the Tyne, it is the combat with Cuchulain's foster brother Loch, and it starts on page 132 of Kinsella's translation, page 92 of Carson's translation, or page 176 of, Ke of Cecilia Rattley's translation of the First Recension. And in all of these, it is preceded by a different account of why the Morrigan is mad at Cuchulain in this particular scene and why she interferes with this particular combat. But that is the story of Time Beregovna, and next time I will tell you the wildly different story, Time Beregovine, and none of us will ever confuse them ever again, I hope. If you have enjoyed this story, please consider dropping a tip in my tip jar, there is a link in the description to my Kofi, because we are in a cost of living crisis and being alive is expensive. You can find all the links to further reading down there as well, and while I'm at it, I'm just going to mention that my YA thriller, The Butterfly Assassin, is available to buy now from all good booksellers in the UK and Ireland. It's coming out in French, in France, in October, and you can get it in ebook and audiobook in the US and other places. So. Links to that are also in the description, and, you know, uh, help me pay my bills, buy my book. Good on my good, I guess slan, I guess beme, I le scale ella. Um, I don't know when. So, thank you, goodbye, I will be back with another story. Soon, I don't know when, it will be time of Ragavine, unless I massively change my mind. See ya!